But Joel, I was wondering if you could just give us some concluding thoughts and then. Sure. Now, one of the things we haven't mentioned actually is that uh, Carl and I began a podcast in January called Inside the Epicenter. And uh, it's, been, it's clear from, to me from this conversation that every single person that we've talked to, uh, we, we're going to need to do multiple podcasts. We're going to use these messages to create podcasts. But I, you know, for just a Khalil, for example, you're just getting a, a smidge, right? And, and I'm guessing that most of you, as, as much involved in ministry as you are, you, you, you may never have met a Gazan at all, a Gazan Palestinian, much less one who loves Jesus, much less who, one who's so articulate and, uh, and, uh, and fearless. And so he needs more opportunity to make the case and explain. And there's so many questions we have. By the way, I also want to, you know, these are all good people to invite to a church, to, to um, a ministry. Um, and Joshua Fund can help you uh, make those connections and invite them. I just want to close with a, a few thoughts. And, and, I, and I was so inspired by uh, my friend Anne because, you know, <laughs> she, it's true. You know, when people invite her, just the way she runs, they, they, you know, they come and speak, and then the Lord will put something on your heart. But I said, come and speak, and this is what the Lord is putting on your heart. <laughs> because I, really, I thought, there's nobody going to be better at explaining the Romans 1.16 love for Jews and Gentiles better than her. Um, and then she said to me, uh, I'm going to tease you just slightly, but just like, I don't know if I really, you know, if it's going to be a good message. And I leaned over tomorrow in the middle. I'm like, yeah, she's way off message. Uh, she really, she's, I don't know what she was thinking about this one. Uh, so encouraging. But as I was sitting there, I was thinking, you know, okay, I don't have a normal life, right? I, I get it. You know, you have normal lives. I, I, and mine is weird. I, you know, we're not all sitting with crown princes and kings. And that's not my daily life. But I, I was thinking um, the first radio interview well, I think it was the third, but the third radio interview I ever did from my first book, I was on a radio station in Rochester, New York, which was my hometown, because my publicist was having trouble getting me on any radio stations because nobody knew who I was. And so just sort of scraping, throwing spaghetti at the wall, trying to make something stick. So they got a rock station, and the most famous but odd host on that rock station Sure, this, I'll, you know, this looks interesting. A guy writes a book about a kamikaze attack on America and leads to a war with Iraq. Sure, I'll read that and I'll have the guy on. And, and if you've ever seen my um, One for Israel um, a testimony video that we did for Erez, um, I, I begin with, dude, how, how did you know? So the, this guy literally talked this way. He's like, dude, this is crazy, this is whack. I mean, come on, how could you know? How could you write a book like this? It's so crazy. I mean, it's like exactly telling us what happened. And, uh, but as we went through that interview, he says, now, I don't understand it. I mean, dude, your name is Rosenberg, right? Right. Well, that's Jewish, right? On my dad's side, yes, my mom's not Jewish. I, whatever. But you got these characters at the end of your book, they're all talking about Jesus. Why? <laughs> what are you, a born again? An evangelical? You know, he said it like with such disdain. It was some toxic, radioactive nightmare. And he, I said, well, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus and, uh, and uh, from a Jewish background. And I, and, and I tried to steer the conversation actually back to the book. That's why I was on the air. That's why my publicist was doing it. That's why my publisher was. But it's true that my heart was to use the book this way. I just didn't see this coming. Not from that guy. Who's na you know, and his name was Brother Wheeze, OK? <laughs> I, and he's like, but dude, why, I don't understand. How can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus? I'm like, well, Mr. Wheeze, it's, um, you know, it's an interesting story. And I'm not sure that you have time to get into it. No, no, are you kidding me? Are you, you know, it's one thing to have a novelist whose novel, whose fictional ideas seem to be coming true before our eyes. That's one thing. But to have a Jew who believes in Jesus, this I got to hear, son. He goes, I'm going to hold you over the break, and we're going to get into that. And we did. And so the third interview I ever did in my life, Sean Hannity was first, so, but uh, was this, and... I got to share the gospel. What 
I didn't expect was, Brother Weiss explained to me in the next segment, he goes, you know, I'm Jewish. I said, no, I thought you might be a Jesuit with Brother Weiss or I don't know what. I never, never saw that coming. And then he took some calls. The first guy that calls was a Jewish kid I knew growing up who was listening to the show. And I'm like, what is happening? A new ministry was born by writing fiction. Uh, didn't see that coming, didn't, but, it was, but that was exciting, and I just thought, wow, what a, what a fun question. How, how can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus? Well, a few years later, I got, to, I got invited uh, to Morocco, the Kingdom of Morocco. The Minister of Islamic Affairs had read one of my novels, had come to our home to meet us for a little dinner party, and then invited me to come, and I'm like, what, so what's your job exactly? He goes, I oversee 33,000 mosques in Morocco. Okay then. And you want me to come? What? So, we're, so he has a dinner party in his home. And he has like their equivalent of the head of Homeland Security and the advisor to this. And the, it was all, a lot of muckety makai level. And he's got this huge, I forget the name of the food, but it's like this big, huge platter of rice and lamb and vegetables. Aromatic was so, my mouth was watering, and he goes, well, before we begin, I've been thinking a lot since my dinner party with you in, at your home in Virginia, but I am confused. Isn't your name Rosenberg? <laughs> yes, it is. Isn't that Jewish? Well, on my father's side, it is. My mom, no. Okay, okay, whatever. <laughs> how are you an evangelical Christian? How, I don't understand how you can be Jewish and believe in Jesus. And I'm like, Lord, are you serious? That's the question at the Minister of Islamic Affairs house? All right, then, let's go. Let's go. That's exciting. That's a fun conversation. Fast forward a few years later. I'm having lunch with Vice President Mike Pence. When we we known each other for a number of years. So we were friends. We were talking about these delegations and the doors that were opening. And the administration was fashioning their peace plan. And they, he wanted to get more nuances. I was sending him written reports, but he wanted to pick my brain because they were looking at, is there anything we ought to, any nuances we ought to put in our Middle East peace plan that maybe you've picked up on or noticed? And so it was a great conversation, fascinating. Diane knew that alone would have been enough. But he said, have you ever met the president? I'm like, no, you know, Mr. Vice President, you know I was a never Trumper. So, all right, follow me. We walk into the Oval Office. First person I see is Mike Pompeo. So that was nice, shook hands with him. Second person I saw was then National Security Advisor John Bolton. So he and I had been friends for a long time. So now I got three people I know, all of them are friends, only two of them are novel readers, but it's okay, John Bolton's you know, a good man anyway. I, <laughs> unconditional love, you know, you don't have to read my novels. To... And then they introduced me to the, vice, or to the president. I won't go through that whole story, it's in the book, but as we sit down, the, the president, and I don't know what I'm up for, uh, into and up for, and I'm not prepared because this isn't on the schedule. And even the meeting itself, uh, Pence had just met it, meant it to be a shake hand, say hi, why don't you meet my friend, he's from Israel, and he's an evangelical. The president said, well, come down, come sit down, let's talk, Joel. And Pence actually tries to wave him off. Uh, he said, like, Look, I know the Czech prime minister is arriving any minute, we've got that lunch, but I just wanted you two to meet. Joel's not in the States that often. Oh, no, we have time. Sit down. So, so I sit right across from the president. He's behind the Resolute desk. The vice president of the United States is sitting here, the secretary of state here, and the national security advisor. And honestly, I've written so many novels about that room, I'd never have been in it. 24 years in Washington. I was always on the wrong side of the political spectrum. Never got invited in. And now I'm sitting there, and I, I was not thinking, what am I going to say? What, what's this going to be? I, I just was thinking of the old Sesame Street ditty, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. You know, like, what am I doing here? And the president throws me a curveball. He says, so tell me a little bit about yourself. I thought he was going to tell me, you know, his Middle East peace thinking. I don't know what. So I'm trying to think, well, what would I say? And then he said, wait, 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 wait. And he turns to Pence and he says, Mike, did you just call Joel an evangelical? Yes, Mr. President. Joel, are you an evangelical? Yes, Mr. President. But isn't your name Rosenberg? I kid you not. <laughs> I kid you not. Isn't your name Rosenberg? 
Yes, it is on my father's side, but not, my mom's not a Jew. Okay, well, whatever. I mean, they always say, whatever. Only a, only a Jewish person, a religious Jewish person, thinks that's significant. But I say it because it's true. He's like, wait, wait, wait. So, but how, how can you be an even juggle if you're Jewish? And I'm thinking, Lord, get out. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? This is my favorite question on the planet. And this is my first substantive conversation in the Oval Office with a president of the United States, one that I'd been opposed to. And I let him have it. <laughs> Gently, respectfully. I, but interesting about that is when I process that later, the opportunity to share the gospel with the president of the United States, I thought, he's actually looking at this not as a Gentile. Gentiles, genuinely, genuinely unless you're a Muslim, aren't going to ask... Uh, it, it, Unless you're, if you're a born-again Christian, you would see it. You would say, oh, how did you become? But if, if, you don't, if you don't see it from that perspective, you would say, I don't understand how that's possible. And he was looking at it as a, he's a Jewish grandfather. I mean, he's not Jewish, but he's got Jewish grandkids. His daughter converted to Orthodox Judaism, Ivanka, to marry Jared. And they, their grandkids are Jewish. So that's, that was pretty fun. Talk about being, needing to be prepared for any opportunity. So a few weeks ago, for all Israel news, I get invited to meet a former prime minister of Israel. Because it's sensitive, I'm not going to say who. But I'm sitting down with him, and he asks me about making Aliyah and the, the boys in the army and what units did they serve. I kid you not. He says, now, th this is an evangelical news site, right? Right. So are you an evangelical? Yes, I am. But your name is Rosenberg. And like, get out. The Lord is opening up doors. I think that there's a great curiosity. Yes, among world leaders, and that's, that's a fun way to tell that story. But I'm telling you that there's an openness. There's a spirit of openness in Israel, even in the Muslim world, in the American Jewish community, um, that it's never happened like this in 2,000 years. And what's, that's exciting. And, and, and I, of all the things I talked to Erez about, I forgot to ask him this. By the way, Erez, you're the expert on the growth of the Messianic body in Israel. He wrote uh, part of a book that was a, a compilation of different authors, but his chapter was about the growth of the body. And he, his research shows that there were 23 known Jewish followers of Jesus in 1948 when Israel was uh, declared independence. 23, okay? And we know most of them, that, those that are still alive. Now, today, there is about 30,000. That's a wonderful amount of growth. Now, in a nation of 6.5 million Jews, it's not nearly enough, but the, the trend line is, is moving up. And most of that's, I would say, in the last 10 years or so. So that's exciting. And a lot of it's because of the seeds that are being planted. This is good. In the United States, Joshua Fund... Uh, invested in a study just a few years ago that showed in 1967, when I was born, there were fewer than 2,000 Jews on the planet. But today, I mean a couple years ago, but essentially today, there are now 871,000 Jewish followers of Jesus in the United States alone. 871,000. That's amazing. The gospel's working. We know it does, but but even the Jews for Jesus and Chosen People Ministries thought maybe the number's 300,000 on the planet a few years ago. It just, that seemed high to them, but they're like, it could be. But now we know there are approximately one million Jewish followers of Jesus on planet Earth. In a world of about 16 or 17 million Jews, depending on how, exactly how you define it. What is that telling us? The curtain is going up, Right? After 2,000 years of, a, of the hardness on our hearts, it, it, it's melting. That hardness, that ice, that block of ice around our hearts, it's melting. When you combine that with all the research that's showing that more Muslims have left Islam and come to faith in Jesus Christ in the last 50 or 60 years than the last 14 centuries combined, you can see that something is happening. Not only are people listening, Jews and Muslims listening to the gospel, Satellite television, internet, radio, and, and various other ways. But many are responding. And at this very moment, however, many in the church are not engaged in 
evangelism to Jews or Muslims. In fact, many love Israel so much, they want to be politically supportive, but they decide, and, but don't worry, we're not going to tell you about Jesus. Now, you know, a difference between Khalil and me, I, I'm, I, I'm happy about Christians who want to show political or humanitarian relief support or various other ways to bless Israel. I think they should show love and support and encouragement and, you know, to our Palestinian friends as well. But my point is this. this th it's kind of crazy that to be at a moment where Jews are more open to the gospel, where Muslims are more open to the gospel, and yet the church is, is unwilling in many places to be in, in, engaged. So that leaves a, a remnant who will say, I, I want a blessing for all of them. But at the heart, if we bless them politically, financially, materially, all the other ways you could do it, and they go to hell, how is that good? And so I just wanted you to hear the heart of our team. We, uh, we're not saying it's easy, and we're not saying we're doing it as best it could ever be done. We're just trying to be faithful with what we're seeing, faithful to the opportunities, uh, but the, the opportunity is enormous. And I'll close with this thought. You know, I, I, I will focus just on the Jewish side for a moment. Pretend that you were, uh, you know, pretend that Jewish evangelism was, was, like, was one company, okay, called Jew, Jew.com, Jewish Evangelism Works.com. Just pretend. And, and pretend this company had been around for 2,000 years and, and that there was a, there was a stock uh, graph on, uh, let's say, CNBC. You could sort of dial in and sort of see the, the, how the stock was performing uh, uh, for Jew.com for the last 2,000 years. So what, you'd zoom in to, let's say, the first century, and you see, oh, oh, there's a real movement. That stock is, they're, 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 things are picking up steam. There's, there's movement, exciting, wow. Maybe not in, you know, right up at the time of Jesus, but in the years that followed, there's growth. But then you're going to see that line, that stock line, they're going to, it's going to flatline for about 2,000 years, right near zero. Jews aren't coming to faith. Now, in the early 1900s, Christian ministries began really sharing the gospel with Jews, humanitarian relief and the preaching of the gospel. And in the early 1900s, we start, started seeing the numbers go up. By, by, the, by the time of World War II, there were approximately 250,000 Jews Jewish believers in Jesus in Europe. And then most of those were killed during the Holocaust. So the stock would go up, and then a sharp drop, and then almost nothing. But now we're seeing in the last 40 or 50 years, and I, I would say in the last 10 or 15 years, we're starting to see that line. That, that, that's a growth opportunity. And if you're a venture capitalist, you're thinking, we should be doing this anyway, no matter what whether there's movement and growth and receptivity or not. But when you see movement, when there's openness, and when there's response, this, is, this would be a good time to invest. And that's why we do it. We invest our time, whatever talents, meager that we might have, our little loaves and fishes, um, our prayer life, and, and, and financially. And we're grateful that you're standing with us. And, you know, the opportunities that Carl laid out, we do that because to be a blessing to you. We don't, this is not a closed fund. We, we're getting a lot of blessings eternally. We're not, you know, it's a lot of challenge now, but, but eternally. We're excited about being involved in this. We're excited about these heroes. We're excited about helping them in any way we can. But we don't want it to be a closed fund. We want you to, you know, at least be aware of it. And if the Lord puts it in your heart, great. Um, if he doesn't, there's lots of other people in the world to reach. But this is an exciting time, and I think God has saved the best for last. I would have said that the Muslims were the last frontier of the gospel, but it turns out they're the next to last. They're the penultimate frontier. The Jews are the alpha and omega of missions. <laughs> but God is drawing us, finally, finally, into the kingdom. And I don't want to do anything else. Yes? He gives me lots of assignments as part of fishing and educating. But I just love working with a team, a team who has other skills and other gifts. And I'd love it if you guys wanted to be part of that team or, or intensify your, or your involvement already. Thank you for being with us. We're going to close. Let me close this in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. 
thank you for this great opportunity. Thank, thank you for these folks flying in from, or driving in from all over the country. How exciting. And we've, I know we've given them a lot, but I pray that you would help them digest it, swallow it, internalize it, and let your will be done. We're grateful for their prayers, their interest. Show us how to answer their questions in the days and weeks and months ahead. Lord, do a, continue to do a great work. You are doing it more than most people realize. And uh, we're just jazzed to be part of it. And uh, may this tribe increase. We thank you and praise you in the name of our great King and Savior who will reign in Jerusalem one day, we hope soon. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. subscribe to our videos by clicking the subscribe button you'll find some videos that we've chosen specifically for you and if this is a ministry that you'd like to support financially just make a tax deductible donation by clicking here to visit our giving page thank you we look forward to partnering with you to bless israel and her neighbors in the name of jesus